I think we're ready to get started. Good evening. I'm Jackie Darrow, president of the League of Women Voters of the Akron area. We are pleased to be presenting this forum that we've been calling The Election is Over, What Did the Voters Say? And really this is an effort as we all try to better understand Ohio's voting behavior in the context of what occurred in our neighboring states and in the nation overall, but in particular, what's in store ahead in Ohio. This program is the first of a three-part series the Leagues of Women Voters of the Akron area and Greater Cleveland have been planning with the Ray, the Ray C. Bliss Institute of Applied Politics at the University of Akron. Our next forums will be focused on what we've learned about how to increase voter registration and turnout, which will be held February 7th in Beechwood, Ohio, you know, just up the road, and Money in Politics, Money in Politics, which will be held here in Akron in April. I'm hoping we can find support for additional forums that tackle important topics like the U.S. Census and the relevance of the Electoral College. Please check our website at lwvaa.org for details as we get closer to these events. Or better yet, become a member and then you'll get our newsletter and you'll have all the relevant information every month. Um, we are pleased to be videotaping this forum tonight and we'll be posting it on our website which is a first for us and we're really very excited to be able to expand the participation in an event like this. In addition to our gratitude to the Bliss Institute for their insight and guidance in planning this program, we, wanna, we also want to thank them for enabling the use of this beautiful facility. It's a real gem in our midst, and I'm sure for many people like me, um, this is my first time here. So we would also thank you. And we'd also wish to thank our other co-sponsors, the Akron Beacon Journal and Common Cause Ohio. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization. We encourage informed and active participation in government. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and we influence public policy through education and advocacy, through forums like this and through uh, lobbying. One advocacy position we hold dear is protecting citizens' right to vote and making it easier to vote. The League has a postcard campaign directed to the new Secretary of State that lists actions we would like to see from that office to increase voter turnout and ensure public confidence in the integrity of elections. We began this campaign way before the election. So please take a moment to sign and mail one of these cards. You'll, I, I forgot to bring one up here, but uh, right. Um, we have them at the table um, where you entered. And uh, the State League is collecting these cards and intends to bundle them all to together and put a, a mountain full on uh, Secretary LaRose's desk when he arrives in office. I'm now very pleased to introduce our moderator, M.L. Schultze, who really doesn't need much introduction here as she's such a familiar voice for listeners of WKSU and as a presence as a moderator for so many political, issue, political and issues forums. Emil Schultze retired from WKSU in July, but you'd hardly know it, um, after nearly 40 years as a reporter, editor, producer, and newscaster. Her work has included award-winning reporting on politics, immigration, the economy, and social and criminal justice, and the Society of Professional Journalists and Associates. Associated Press have both recognized her as the best radio reporter in Ohio. Woohoo! <laughs> Before coming to WKSU, she worked at the repository in Canton for 25 years, where she was managing editor for nearly a decade. She's appeared on NPR, Here and Now, The Takeaway, and C-SPAN, and continues to do freelance audio and newspaper reporting. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to M.L. Schultze, who will in introduce tonight's panelists. Now we have to do the and my main job here tonight is to be quiet and learn. 
as I hope all of us will. Um, this is very much an interactive forum. We want everybody here to participate as much as possible and asking questions and getting the discussion to the gritty level that it needs to be. What does politics mean to me? What does electoral office mean to me? And what does democracy mean to me? So we have three people to help guide us through this discussion, and I'd like to introduce them brief briefly. Uh, just because I like to mix things up, I'm gonna start in the center. Gregory Moore is the, one of the nation's leading voting rights advocates. He served as the executive director of the NAACP National Voter Fund, and through the 2018 elections, coordinated all national programs designed to promote voter rights and election reform while increasing voter education and participation among African Americans and other communities of color. He's also president of GTM Consulting Services and was chief of staff and legislative director for the dean of the Congressional Black Caucus, Representative John Conyers. But he's got an Ohio connection, honest. He earned his bachelor's degree from Ohio University. He's also the author of an upcoming book called Democracy's Broken Promise. Let's hope that's not not written in stone. We'll work on that title. <laughs> Dr. John Green, to my immediate left, is the interim president of the University of Akron and has been in that role since May. Uh, he's had more than 30 years of service at the University of Akron as an administrator and faculty member, including as dean of the university's largest academic unit, the Bokto College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Green also is director of the nationally renowned Racy Bliss Institute of Applied Politics a senior research advisor for the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, and a political analyst for a number of national and regional media organizations. He's written nine books, at, boy, and I was feeling under it. <laughs> uh, he's edited 32 other books, and he's authored more than 100 articles. And his PhD comes from Cornell University. Michael Douglas, to the far left is the Akron Beacon Journal's editorial editor. He joined the newspaper back in 1983 as an editorial writer, and he worked for a time as a reporter for the newspaper. He returned to the editorial board in 1991, becoming the chief editorial writer. In March of 1999, Mr. Douglas assumed his current position as the editorial page editor. He's responsible for opinions expressed by the newspaper's editorial board. He oversees the op-ed page and the letters to the editor and writes the paper's daily editorials and weekly column. He's also the treasurer of the John S. Knight Memorial Journalism Fund, which annually awards scholarships to college journalism students. And he also is in the unenviable position of explaining the counterintuitive setup of newspapers that opinion has no influence on what reporters report, right? <laughs> and nobody believes you. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to start with a few questions, but again, I'm asking that you guys grab cards and pens and let us know some of the questions that are in your minds. Uh, if you're not in Georgia or in Florida or in certain segments of California, the election really is over. Um, but, of course, what we've all learned is that we are no longer talking about something that comes to an end. Our elections are a continual process, and they flow from one end to the other. And if anybody needed absolute proof of that, take a look at the announcement this week that Sherrod Brown is exploring a presidential run. Uh, it, it ain't over, ever. <laughs> I don't care who sings, it's not over. So we, we want to make sure that we take a look at what did occur last week, but also use that to, as a way of looking forward to what is coming, not only in our elected politics, but also in our census and redistricting and some other issues that are on the further horizon. But first, taking a look back, and this may seem a kind of an odd place to start, but I want to look first at an issue. We had one issue on the ballot. It was issue one. It was statewide, and it would have forced a change in how justice issues are handled, especially drug crimes are handled in the state of Ohio. And I'm going to ask, starting with you, Mr. Moore, I'm going to ask, why did that issue lose so miserably? That's an easy, that's an easy one. <laughs> Well, thank you, first of all, to all of you who came tonight and became a part of this. I want you to excuse me for changing my glasses because I have reading glasses and glasses to see you all. That's just the way it works for me. So I'll take these off now so I can see you better. So thank you. Um, issue one was important. Um, I was active in the signature drive uh, to help out this spring. We were very active, as you, some of you may know, on 
trying to help pass issue one around redistricting reform. I was part of that negotiating team that met with the uh, House and Senate leaders in uh, late 2017 and negotiated up until that very last day uh, before the deadline to try to get that uh, provision on the ballot, uh, first through the legislature and then on the ballot. It was a bipartisan effort. It had a lot of support from the League of Women Voters and Fair Districts, Fair Elections. Uh, it was uh, grassroots, it was in multiple counties, it had support from both Democrats, Republicans, it had support of the media, it had support of elected officials, it had support of the progressive community, and really was the type of victory that we can all embrace as the way it should be done in a state like Ohio. I can't see the same thing happen for issue one in the fall, where we had a very aggressive signature drive, which I was a part of, which helped uh, gather enough signatures to place on the ballot, over 700,000 signatures. So it's very clear that the voters of Ohio uh, had very much the same level of passion, maybe not as deep, but as wide of passion because they were able to qualify for the ballot. Um, as you know, these are a lot not, you know, redistricting was not an easy topic and neither is criminal justice reform. But it was a very holistic approach. Uh, it had retroactivity attached to it. Um, it unfortunately became mired down in the political uh, partisan battle between the governor's uh, race and the commercials, as you all saw, uh, painted a very grim and scary picture of what would happen if issue one passed. Uh, we didn't have that type of advertising on issue one in the, in, around redistricting. So obviously, even though there was a lot of money to help collect the signatures and put commercials on the air, I just believe that uh, the opposition from the courts, particularly our Supreme Court uh, members uh, who actually made their voices uh, uncharacteristically heard on this, uh, really put uh, the damper on anybody who wanted to even uh, from the, I guess, the judicial branch expressed support for it. So it was um, hard. I have more to say about that, but that's just my general answer on why I think it did not pass. Um, Michael, you were nodding your head. Um, a, a lot of the letters you got, a lot of the input you got beyond the judges, many of them absolutely opposing this, were people saying, I just don't like the way we keep monkeying with the Constitution with specific issues. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, yes, I, I mean, I think that that was the the most troubling a troubling aspect of the of the issue. Um, you can't make an easy change, and I think people understood that uh, this was a legislative type of issue where you could go in and fix something, and then maybe you make mistakes or you need to make repairs, and you go back in and fix it again. And to be able to do that with a constitutional amendment is, it's, it's, it's just virtually impossible. You have to generate a campaign, you gotta, the legislature could put it on the ballot, but you, you gotta go through the whole process of, uh, of changing it with, through a vote, uh, of, of, through voters. And it's just um, more difficult than you need to make something in which things are changing all the time. I mean, this is an issue in which you need to make adjustments. Different crimes um, uh, and sentencing uh, lengths uh, 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 make it problematic, and so you have to go in and make changes quickly and, uh, and subtle changes at times. And uh, that's just not, in my view, um, something, that, um, something that's uh, well made for a constitution will change. And, and, and I think that was, uh, at least for us on the editorial page at the Beacon Journal and others, that was the key, that was the key thing. I mean, I, I think many of the things that they proposed were, were good ideas. They're really ideas we're already using. They were refining them to make them more applicable to the changing nature of the drug problem. And so it was a perfect example of, of actually why you needed to make it a legislative changes and not constitutional changes. So, Dr. Green, we're talking about one of those places where politics and governance, which are not always interchangeable, came together. As we leave that election behind, you have, on one hand, you have a lot of people, even who opposed issue one, who are saying, okay, the legislature needs to act, the legislature needs to move, but the first action of the legislature seems to be to say, 
Should these constitutional amendments, should it be so easy to get them on the ballot? And our, the legislature is now talking about changing some of the standards. Can you talk about that dynamic a little bit? Oh, certainly. Uh, but first of all, let me uh, thank you all for being here and uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to get my talking politics fix. <laughs> um, in my, my day job, um, I couldn't talk about politics um, all, uh, all during this very exciting campaign, lest people misinterpret my comments and think that the university has a partisan position, which it does not. But now the election's over. So, you know, I can, I can have some fun. So anyway, it's really a lot to be here. You know, there, there has been um, a, a lot of concern about the uh, process of amending the Constitution here in Ohio. Um, and uh, the, there's a, a perception in many quarters that it's much too easy to do. Now, it's not as easy here as it is in some places like California, but so, so that a lot of um, poorly considered uh, matters get on the ballot and then people vote on them. Um, you know, v voters are not fools, but they're also not often well informed about a lot of issues. So um, I think the, the first big pushback we saw was back a couple of years ago where there was actually an amendment to the Constitution to prohibit certain kinds of amendments <laughs> to the Constitution, which was really cool, right? The really ironic sort of um, um, the amendment to end all amendments. But, but I, I think we're going to see further consideration in that direction. Um, and uh, I, but there, there has to be some kind of balance there. Um, you know, the uh, certainly the kinds of changes to the Constitution about procedures we would want to have a, a public vote on that. That's, that's part of our constitutional tradition. But, but where do you draw the line? Because at some point, uh, process and substance come together. Um, and I, I don't think most of our um, uh, colleagues in, in the, among the voting population would want to eliminate all ballot issues, right? But they maybe just want to do it in a little bit uh, different way. Um, and you know, one of the reasons that uh, we have pressure to put things on the ballot and then ballot campaigns is to try to motivate the legislature to act on certain issues. And we have plenty of examples where the, and, and redistricting is a good one, where mm -hmm. the threat, if you will, of a ballot issue brought people together uh, and they came up with a pretty good uh, proposal. So, um, you know, there's a, we need to see come some kind of middle ground here uh, where we can, uh, you know, uh, goad the legislature when it needs to be goaded, but also have, uh, you know, more restrictions on what gets on the ballot. And I would ask all or any of the three of you to, to jump in on this because we're, we're easing toward redistricting, which is, is a part of this. Um, folks have looked at the map and said, I don't see myself reflected in the map, the congressional map or the legislative map. I don't see urban areas. I don't see Northeast Ohio represented in that map. And so, yeah, I'm going to turn to direct. I'm not going to trust my representative government as much, I'm going to go with direct issues. Can you talk about that dynamic? Well, on my part, I think there's, there's a lot of things that people saw. I think the examples on redistricting is one example, but I was involved in an effort in 2011 where the legislature passed a very regressive uh, voter suppression bill, uh, HB 194. Uh, it was put through the legislature on a strictly partisan basis. There was really no basis for putting such a bill with such restrictions on voting. It rolled back some of these very referendum uh, um, obligations or privileges that we have in the state of Ohio. And it would have basically made it harder for people of color, young people, low-income people to have their votes counted. So uh, the former Secretary of State, Jennifer Bruner, uh, came to me and asked could I help her in her battle to sort of put an end to this and start a petition drive to stop, uh, to repeal that legislation. And we started Fair Elections Ohio and we were successful in getting the uh, signatures we needed to get on the ballot. But the board, uh, the ballot board, uh, in their great wisdom, decided to take it off of the ballot and the legislature uh, basically went back and decided to repeal it themselves. So again, this was uh, not the best thing because a lot of us wanted to go at it and have 2012 as the year we would overturn a major ballot measure. Uh, we were also fighting at the same time the collective, I mean, the right to work 
a ballot measure SB5. So those two things were both going to be on the ballot in 2012. But the legislature, seeing the over one million signatures, said, hey, let's take this other thing off the ballot and let us just repeal this ourselves. So we've repealed everything but one or two provisions dealing with weekend voting. Uh, but I saw democracy in action there. And so I think we need to be careful about efforts by the legislature to make it harder for citizens groups to use the right of referendum uh, to try to fight, uh, not try to fight, but try to be a part of that legislative process. If the legislature is not acting on the issues that are most critical to the people, then the people have the right to either put forth that as a part of the issue base that they think needs to be addressed or to go to the, le the people to repeal something that the legislature has made a decision. So I think we need to keep our eye on any efforts by the uh, legislature uh, to roll this back. And one more thing to remember, the threshold for getting signatures just increased dramatically because of the very high turnout that we just had. So it won't be as easy to get these issues on the ballot as before. So they should take some solace into that. You know, on the issue of redistricting, it's going to be really interesting after the 2020 census here in Ohio because both at the state level and for congressional districts, we have a new process uh, for doing that. And um, one, one of the things that I, there's some standards connected to those processes that, that are very popular, but also there's some political incentives built into that process uh, to encourage the political people who inevitably draw these lines to, to do a better job, you know, rather than, than a worse job. And so it's just going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. I, I don't see very much change in uh, congressional or state legislative elections until after that process has a chance to operate. And, and we, we may see some dramatic changes. Michael, lean in, in a little bit to your mic so we can hear you, um, or bring your mic a little closer to you. How about um, that? I, I, I was just going to kind of hitchhike on the, on the point that was made earlier about hey, the process is messy. We shouldn't be upset because someone goes out and collects many, many signatures, gets something on the ballot, and asks us to vote, or to make a determination on that. That's good. That's a good process, and and uh, that's it's the quality of the issue that we then make a decision. Well, this isn't very good. We shouldn't have a monopoly on casinos, or or, or we should, and 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 so I think that we need to. All, I would agree that we would need to be very very um, uh, reluctant to kind of change the process too much. Access is good, and it's and the debate is good. Uh, you may disagree with the outcome or agree with the outcome. So getting back to redistricting, um, <clears throat> you, Dr. Green, you mentioned you know that basically you don't expect a lot to change until after the next census and then we get to the new process. Should Ohioans just figure pretty much we're going to tread water until then or even watch things get more <laughs> entrenched and bitterly fought over in 2020, so candidates go into 2022 with some incumbency? Well, you know, that may very well happen. Of course, you could say it's happening already. Mm -hmm. uh, which no, is, things which are is, bitterly fought over? Yeah, yeah, you may have noticed that. But um, the, so it's, a, it's an interesting problem. Um, but, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to discourage anybody from being active politically even while we're waiting for redistricting to occur because uh, there, are, there are opportunities that present themselves. And, you know, as, as, just to pick up on Michael's point, uh, democracy is messy, right? And, and sometimes part of the mess is you have an unfavorable map. Um, but, you know, there, people still should be active because they need to express their views. And, you know, th change may occur, um, but, but we'll see a lot more when we get a different kind of districting process. And but, I'm sorry, Michael. Yeah, I mean, it's, but it is also worth emphasizing that the actual vote uh, was 51-45. Republicans got 51% of the vote and 75% of the seats. Um, even if it were 10-6, they, they'd still have 60%. And so, I mean, you, um, uh, it's a very lopsided system, and in 2020, Republicans are going to win 12 of the 16 seats. I mean, it's, it's, it's virtually guaranteed. 
Yeah, we saw yeah. no movement, real movement at the needle in well, this election, I, did I, we? I do want to say on the first congressional district in Cincinnati and the 12th congressional district in Franklin County, uh, there was a window there. The uh, uh, Danny O'Connor race was a national race. It got a lot of attention, if you all remember that. I think it was in August, special election, and uh, it was a whisker. Of course, he did not win by a big margin, but there was the needle didn't move. But I think that uh, it proved that you know some of these districts there is some room. They're terrible districts. There is some pending litigation, I believe, that uh, ACLU has filed on these current maps. I and that's that's the first okay, question from our audience. No, <laughs> that's um, that the ACLU and the League of Women Voters and some other groups are not willing yes. to tread water and have filed a lawsuit. Do any of you have any thoughts on how successful that is or is not likely to be? It would force the change up by two years. I guess it depends on where it lands. I mean, in, in terms of judges and that kind of thing. So. Um, I, I don't know. I, I wish them the best. <laughs> yeah, I think it was um, uh, the timing of the lawsuit was the only thing I had an issue with. We had just negotiated this package with uh, the Republicans and the Democrats on a bipartisan basis, and I think the lawsuit came right after we won. <laughs> so it made it, you know, at least on the other Republican side, they were suggesting that we had this in our back pocket. But I think. Um, uh, it's a chance this legislation could get some hearing, but the way the Supreme Court looks now, I don't give it much of a shot, but uh, who knows? Um, but I do believe that um, the lawsuit gives another chance, one final bite of the apple of these, these maps, and then we'll go on to 2021. Uh, but on principle, it should be at least uh, argued in court one more time against these maps. Okay. Um Meanwhile, we've got the maps we've got, we've got the representation we've got, we have a legislature that still has a supermajority for Republicans and a congressional delegation that is 12-4. Do you, any of you see room for movement and compromise in these political bodies as they're drawn? Do you see issues that there's likely to be some coming together of the minds, the hearts? Well, I think so. Um, for one thing, we have a new governor, and a lot of what happens in the legislature is driven by what the governor wants to do. And, um, you know, actually, one of the reasons we had such a close gubernatorial election is both parties nominated really good candidates, you know, put, either of whom would have been quite uh, good, uh, good governors. And, and so, you know, Mike DeWine may, was going to have an opportunity, um, in, starting with next year's budget, but also with other things, to, um, uh, you know, try to to have some bipartisan uh, in the uh, bipartisanship in the legislature. You know, the, this is one of those problems where you know it's it's unclear if you know what causes what. And, and I hope that that leadership that if if he were to bring forward uh, things that both parties could support, that um, we you know we could see some cooperation. Um, you know, we'll have to see how that that works. But but the window is probably fairly narrow for him to to offer those types of of operations. And you know, there's a couple of roadblocks in the way. The uh, Republicans that control the general the House of Representatives are locked in a leadership battle, which uh, may may poison the waters. Uh, you know, even more. Michael. Yeah, I I, I think there is an opportunity uh, on uh, on education. I think that Mike DeWan has made a, uh, a big commitment um, to early education. Um, and uh, I know we've heard this over and over again, but I, I think there actually are people, uh, Republicans in the legislature, Peggy Lehner, even the speaker, uh, Ryan Smith, who are interested in uh, routing more resources to uh, poor school districts and beginning to deal with this both equity and adequacy problems. And, um, and Mike DeWine's committed to that and has been committed to that for many years. It, various forms of Mike DeWine have been committed to that. <laughs> uh, uh, um, and this form uh, appears uh, um, um, more committed. And so I, I would look for a oppor real opportunity there to, for some bipartisan 
you saw a lot of candidates, Republicans, running away from charter schools in this election, uh, where in the past they've embraced them. Do you see anything changing with that? Yeah, I, th I think they're going to try to change the way they're funded uh, in two ways. One, to have it performance-based somehow, get a performance-based and not on enrollment. And, and, and the other one is to take the charter schools out, uh, get, a, get away from this process in which we route the money to the public schools and then the public schools have to give the money up to the charter schools, which is just, you know, just not a good process. And I think they're going to try to fund charter schools uh, directly. So those two things are, are, are possible. Of course, that require what well, the problem is holding charter, certain charter schools, there are many good ones, but the, the poor performers to the kind of standards that uh, and have consequences for failing to meet them. Can I just say that the issue of the, re, uh, of the um, criminal justice reform, mm -hmm. again, we heard uh, uh, Attorney General DeWine say uh, he's for some of the merits of the bill, but it was just the process that we talked about putting in the Constitution. So if that's true, I would hope that he would put some emphasis on pulling people together and seeing what of this uh, issue one is acceptable that can be embraced on a bipartisan basis. The opioid pro cr crisis has not gone away. Uh, people are still being incarcerated for something that's a mental health or a a, a treatment problem or a medical condition. So we do want to uh, address and remedy that. So I think that's a, that's an area. Uh, also, I think the uh, redistricting issue again, real quick. Uh, uh, the uh, incoming um, Secretary of State. Uh, was a supporter of issue one. He did support us in some difficult times when it was tough for Republicans to support um, redistricting reform. So I hope that he's going to stand with us um, in 2021 and make sure we have fair maps. So I'm keeping my um, hopes open for that. And that's also on the issue one and the uh, justice reform is also an area where uh, a version of Mike DeWine has been very, uh, you know, open to that kind of change. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, he was certainly as lieutenant governor way back uh, in the Voinovich years. But he, I think he got a bit of an education there and, 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 um, and uh, that could kind of changed his point of view. Maybe that could be reawakened, uh, reawakened in some way. Okay. Um, Dr. Green, this is a question from the audience. Ohio already has some of the most restrictive laws limiting a woman's right to choose. What do you see coming down the pike with this legislature and as importantly with this governor who's made um, his opposition to abortion very key in all his forms? Uh, you know, I, th I think that there'll be continued efforts to uh, restrict access to abortion. Um, and the, um, but that's not unique to Ohio. It's happened in a, in a lot of places. Um, you know, the, the country's fairly polarized on the issue of abortion. And in, in states where um, there's pretty even a partisan balance, not much tends to happen. But when you get the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, it works both ways, with large majorities, then they tend to pursue their, their particular agenda. Uh, up to this point, many of those restrictions have been limited by, by the federal courts. Uh, so one of the, the big issues is what will the new majority on the U.S. Supreme Court uh, do uh, uh, about abortion? Uh, I have no idea, uh, but even if, if one were to take the views of uh, the most recent uh, uh, confirmed justice is that Roe versus Wade is settled law. There is within the logic of Roe versus Wade uh, a mechanism for restricting abortion, and that is, as I'm sure many of you know, part of the argument of uh, Roe versus Wade was it had turned on the viability of the fetus, and because of um, medical advances, you know, viability has changed. And so I would not be surprised if um, the, this Supreme Court might change, with, just within the broad framework of Roe versus Wade, change the way it actually operates. And what that would do is that would open up a, a lot of efforts at the s state level to further r restrict abortion. I think that, um, actually, uh, I, given the, the, re, the previous little bit of round of answers uh, regarding compromise, I, I, 
I would really like to see Mike DeWine, which I don't expect this at all, but it would be a nice gesture to basically say we're going to uh, 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 not deal with the heartbeat bill. Um, the heartbeat bill, for those who don't know it. Uh, well, the heartbeat bill is meaning that abortion would be banned uh, at the time of ability to detect a fetal heartbeat, which would be about seven weeks. Um, and uh, we already have, uh, um, already have a ban on 20 weeks, which is, of course, um, less than we have, where viability begins roughly about at 24 weeks. <coughs> So we have a ban at 20 weeks already. Maybe we should wait and see how that goes uh, through the courts and the challenges before we, before we have the heartbeat bill. But I just also want to equate it with his, 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 another area of compromise where he said he's not going to go forward on a right to work a law. Well, well let's, because it's to be just too divisive. Well, I, I would think the heartbeat bill would probably fit into that same category of being too divisive, so I, I, I don't expect it. Uh, I mean, I, right now the legislature may consider passing it, the bill in the lame duck session and making Kasich veto it again. I mean, there's some thought about that. Mm -hmm. So they could then override uh, Kasich's veto. But I, I would hope that, that that to me would be a way for Mike DeWine to maybe say, uh, things are gonna be different, things matter to me, uh, on this, but but I I really don't want to go go to extremes. I'd, I'd rather do make gestures, uh, f as he said in his victory speech about pulling pulling Ohioans together. You have two governors of the same party, but very different styles. Um, <laughs> in outgoing Governor Kasich and incoming Governor Dewine, can you can you talk a little bit about how you see? their imprint, the imprint changing on the state of Ohio. Dr. Green, of uh, our governor, who is our governor? Well, uh, John Kasich's a very heterodox Republican um, in, in lots and lots of ways. Um, and, um, you know, not a, a person who um, suffers fools gladly, or at least the people that he perceives as, uh, as being fools. Uh, you know, and, and um, so, you know, the very abrasive style. It's, it really is fascinating to me. Back in the primaries when he was uh, running against Donald Trump and suddenly we had the born again John Kasich who was, you know, reasonable and and uh, collegial and easy to get along with. And it, it, it was just interesting because that, that's, I mean, whether you agree with the governor or not, he, he has a fairly acerbic style. Not at the level of Donald Trump, of course, but the, um, but, but Mike DeWine's a, a much more conciliatory individual. Um, you know, some people like to say that he's actually kind of boring, uh, but, but, but boring in the good sense of boring, right? That he gets along with people, he works for compromise. Um, I, I think we'll just see a very different style a policy making under DeWine. Um, you know, let's leave aside the politics for a moment. Just I think the style will be very different than with Kasich. I would guess, I would hope that Governor, Kate, Governor um, DeWine would be uh, a, uh, a new portrait of a leader who's probably not running for re-election, who has the luxury of bringing people together. Uh, he's achieved every single position you can possibly achieve in Ohio now, so uh, there's nothing to run, else to run for, but bringing people together would be a good thing. On the heartbeat bill, for instance, I mean, uh, there's no reason to distinguish himself from Kasich to say, well, I'm going to sign it since Kasich vetoed it. There will be people across this country want him to do that. There will be forces coming in trying to get that to make this state a laboratory for some of those type of battles again, trying to get back up to the Supreme Court. And so we don't want Ohio to be a laboratory for the woman's right to choose a court battle of 2021 and 22. Um, I shuddered last week um, when um, Justice Ginsburg fell because it was just a reminder <laughs> that uh, if you think five to, five to four is bad, wait to six to three. And so knowing that that history is, knowing that that's a possibility in the next three to four years, I would not seek to make this state a laboratory for those kinds of things. And hopefully DeWine, uh, Governor DeWine, will be the kind of governor that will be remembered like Governor Voinovich, who's loved on both sides of the aisle. So here's his chance to do it. I don't know him uh, very much. Uh, I know who he is, but I'm saying I don't know 
the type of political leader he is. We got to know Kasich because he has higher aspirations, and that sometimes makes people think more broadly in their uh, thought process and how they reach out to people. But uh, I just haven't seen that with Governor DeWine yet, and hopefully that's going to happen. And that's why I'm keeping a little bit optimistic about this uh, upcoming session. Just to echo a little bit, uh, um, I think that the styles will be just vastly different. And I think if you think of the governor, uh, Governor Kasich, um, I mean, he still hasn't got that severance tax passed. Uh, he still hasn't got his gun legislation passed. He, 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 he has this, as John was saying, he has this kind of new look about him, or has had it, uh, since he quit being governor sometime in, what, 2015. Uh, um, but he, he, uh, he has not been able to deliver. Uh, and that's largely because no one in the legislature can stand him. Uh, and they would just really rather deal, not deal with him. Mike DeWine, uh, just, just in his DNA, disagree with him on a variety of things, but he will try to, will talk to legislators, listen to legislators, not dictate to legislators. Uh, the, there'll be a whole different process at the state house. You, you touched on guns, um, and we have a question about that. We have repeated surveys that show that voters overall support some common, what's called common sense gun regulation, um, that even in Ohio and even among gun owners, there's m some push for some more restrictions in place. Is any of that going to play out in Ohio with this legislature? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I wish I knew the answer uh, to that. Um, but you know, the, I mean, part of the problem is, of course, that there are very well organized interests that uh, don't want to see these types of changes. And you know, they're very, um, you know, they by and large play by the rules, but they just they play very, very effectively. But in a state like Ohio, where we've got a lot of geographic diversity, we have big cities, small towns, rural areas, it's difficult to craft uh, you know, a, a gun bill that, that um, would bring about these common sense um, uh, restrictions because it, different parts of the state see those things different ways, right? And so, um, you know, the, would, I think the, we might persuade the governor and the state senate, but uh, the, the House of Representatives would be tough because, um, and maybe this goes back to our redistricting uh, questions, but we, because we have a lot of representatives who, who represent very traditional rural areas, um, which don't have the kinds of problems that some urban areas have. So crafting a compromise there can be really, really difficult. And you know, it, it, and if it's hard enough in Ohio, imagine how hard it is in Washington, D.C., right, where you have people from, from all over the United States with uh, different perceptions. Well, on, on the guns, you know, we saw this great movement that came out of Florida, tragically, behind something that you don't want to have a movement around. And that's in, in Connecticut and in California and in places that have had this kind of, and now Pennsylvania, you are really getting people start taking a second look at this. And I'm hoping and praying that uh, we don't need to have that in Ohio to get serious about this. But uh, I was there at the March for Our Lives in Washington, and it was really the most energized march I'd ever been to, second only to the Women's March that happened in January. But these were really uh, energetic young kids. and. They went to the legislature in Florida. They made some changes. They put forth some demands. There were some reasonable compromises. And I think the one thing that I would fault my young, I was a student organizer for a long time, so I know how that is. Uh, but declaring victory at some point, they really passed something that was here the before un, un, unfathomable, or not even possible in the Florida legislature, which was some common sense gun measures. So I think we need to look at the Florida legislation, see what it looks like, what is reasonably uh, worth considering in Ohio, and maybe trying to find some uh, semblance of uh, support here in the state for that. Just an idea. I, I, there is a uh, very reasonable set of proposals put forward by the governor and a group of gun rights activists, or not activists, but advocates, former legislators, who got together uh, on the impetus of the governor to 
find this common ground, and they, they, they've proposed that, uh, half a dozen ideas. A couple of them are, were made law in Florida, um, and, and nothing has happened. The question there is, is um, um, whether that's just a reflection of the, the bad relationship that the governor has with the legislature, um, or whether there is actually room for something as modest as that to pass. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, I don't know where Mike DeWine wants to put all his capital, but uh, he, he didn't talk a lot about guns during the campaign. Um, Dr. Green, you mentioned the urban-rural split in the legislature. Um, in fact, if you look at the map, there's a dominance of southern Ohio, the rural areas of Ohio. Uh, is there any way that urban areas can be heard in a legislature that's drawn so far to rural? Well, it's a real challenge, um, you know, but and that's where um, not only do we, we need leadership from the governor to recognize, see, one of the things about a governor is they represent, at least in theory, all the people in the state. And so, we, but, but also we need some creative leadership from uh, people who represent those urban districts. And this is where there could be some really good bipartisan work. Because some of the things that central cities need and want are things that small towns and suburbs need and want too. Um, and you know, one, one of the things that comes to mind is the whole issue of infrastructure. I mean, cities really need some help, but the rest of the state needs help too. So, you know, there may be a, a, a place where, where that can happen. But, you know, this, um, but, it's, but it's an uphill battle. Uh, for uh, for urban areas to get the kind of voice uh, that they would like to have. If I could just share some statistics that I was trying to pull together for this meeting, but uh, the most polarized part of our state is in these rural and urban districts. And you just look at the numbers. Uh, Cordray won 63% of the urban vote. Uh, of, the, of the suburban vote, he won 43%. Of the rural vote, he won 33%. All right, so that's where it's coming. Where the battle is are the ring suburbs around these cities uh, where, again, uh, it was more of a situation where that's where the, the, the balance may tend to be, the growth may tend to be. Franklin County, where, again, the outer rung suburbs was still 63% uh, for DeWine, but the idea is just that there's places where outside of these core cities, some of the movement that we've been talking about for bipartisanship exists. So if we can get it in the area surrounding Franklin County, uh, Montgomery County, you know, Dayton, Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, that's where some of that, those people who are in those seats represent the legislators who can be, the, uh, the people who can be the key to some of these issues being resolved on a bipartisan basis. But when I, I looked at the numbers, I, I'm sorry, I didn't look at for them for Summit County, but in Cuyahoga County, voter turnout was up as it was statewide yeah. in the previous election, but it still was pretty abysmal in Cleveland. If people aren't voting, how do their interests, I mean, it seems like it'd be a lot easier to ignore their interests if they're not voting. Well, uh, well voting in Cleveland has a lot to do with who's on the ballot, what they're talking about, and what type of energy is being put toward turnout. I mean, too often, you know, our campaigns uh, uh, have been focused on the last three or four weeks and so the last three or four months or even years. So motivating voters around issues is important, but we've seen it happen. But this core turnout of urban centers, the places where people move the most often are the lowest income, have the most impacted by the cuts to the, um, to the, from the state to the cities. They're impacted by that. And so the, the ability to um, vote in higher numbers has a lot to do with where you live and how long you've lived there and whether or not you were removed by one of John Husted's tricks, you know, tricks to get you off the ballot. Those things have a lot to do with where you live. And so that's where the core of our provisional ballots come from. That's where the core of our unregistered purging is coming from. Uh, it's from those inner cities. So we got to keep our eye on that battle and make sure we are not sort of disenfranchising urban centers and then making uh, the true voice of the voters uh, really uh, unreflective of the actual uh, numbers that exist in the state rather than those who are just still on the books and able to have their votes counted on election day. Well, 
As some of you may have uh, um, heard of John Begala from the Center for Community Solutions. He was the executive director for years. Two years ago, he released a study called, um, which I've written about, but uh, no one seems to pay much attention, uh, called uh, 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 Small Towns, Big City Problems. And he, he basically kind of did a, uh, a dissection of the two urban centers, large urban centers, and, and, and small towns, focusing mostly on those small towns that don't have universities or, um, or some other mechanism to uh, drive a, their local economy. And, and he found that, that rural and urban, the rural and urban communities have the exact same are very similar um, profiles. Um, they both have high Medicaid use. They both uh, have uh, high property crime rates. They both have opioid problems. Uh, and, and, and you would think this would be a place uh, to be able to kind of build a coalition uh, with these, with a, as, as John suggested, a kind of gifted candidate to be able to um, to kind of bridge that uh, bridge that gap and share with uh, show what these two communities share and build an agenda to move the state forward because that's a large part of the state. Uh, yet it and and uh, I say that to David Pepper and he nods and pats me on the head and 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 and, and yet I think that that. When if I'm a Democrat and I'm looking at the last 16 years at, at the vote, and I'm seeing Western Ohio get redder and redder, and I'm seeing Northeastern Ohio get redder and redder, and Southeastern Ohio get redder and redder. Uh, and if you look at the counties that Brown and Cordray won, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the kind of Northern tier, Cordray wasn't as fortunate, but that northern tier of Erie, Sandusky, Cuyahoga, um, and Summit, Trumbull. But they've lost a lot of votes uh, in these rural areas. And I think for Democrats, but also for the state as a whole, it would be um, beneficial to have people begin to think about what John Begall is writing about, that here you have you shared problems. Let's let's have a let's have an approach or put a priority on this to help both sets of both rural and urban communities. And it's um, it, it's it's there in the in the vote again uh, the vote again uh, on Tuesday. And there was a lot of hand wringing af after 2016. What happened in Trumbull County? Right. What happened to these blue collar Democratic areas? that suddenly aren't anymore. Did you see any sign that any of that is coming back to the Democrats from Tuesday's election, or? Well, it was a little. I mean, I think they, they did better in some of the in northeastern Ohio, um, but they didn't do better. Montgomery County went for DeWine. Yeah. Uh, um, and so you, 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 law, you, you didn't, you just did not see a democratic voice being able to kind of penetrate. In fact, John Begala emailed me, uh, you know, on the morning after the election to tell me when the, you know, when the heck are the Democrats going to get a voice, speak to rural Ohio. And, and, uh, and it's especially uh, uh, important to be able to do so because otherwise this is, uh, uh, not going to be pretty um, uh, for the Democratic Party going forward. Yeah, I just want to add, I, I went to school at Ohio University in the <laughs> 1980s, and um, back then you had to drive down, there was no big interstate, so you had to drive down. We drove down through Columbus, but the shorter way was to come straight down 77, go to Marietta and over uh, 50. Uh, so you have to go to a lot of small towns, and I went through those small towns for four years, and it was really coming down from Cleveland, and the poverty there, I, I was struck by it, by uh, how much, how little investment there was down in that part of the state, and um, it wasn't Cleveland, it wasn't the east side of Cleveland where I grew up, but it was a different type of poverty, it was a different type of, just with a lot of dollar stores and a lot of small 
towns with one or two um, gas stations, but it wasn't a lot of investment. And I just was struck by that and uh, was wondering when that was ever going to happen. Even today, I still question the parties. You know, I'm glad they focus on the urban centers for the last five weeks, but uh, I would like to, to know what is going to be done to try to change this dynamic because uh, there is poverty all across this uh, Appalachia, but I have not seen what you've been talking about here happen uh, since I've been around. Um, which kind of gets us to the next question, which is Ohio still a purple state? Um, do we give up the ghost on that? <laughs> Dr. Green? Well, it's definitely still a battleground state. Um, you know, even in, in uh, 2016, where President Trump won a very large margin, he won by eight percentage points, which is about the margin he won Texas by, still, you know, the upper end was just a little bit over 50 percent. And if you look at the, the success of the Republican statewide candidates in this election, still just slightly, you know, either around 50 percent or a little bit higher than that. So, so I think it's definitely a battleground state. But I do think that the demography is shifting. And uh, a group of voters that, um, well, there's several different groups of voters that were historically tied to one party or another are starting, they're, they're up for grabs or they're starting to move. And there's been a lot of talk about, um, you know, white working class men particularly, but women as well, and places like Mahoning County and, and so forth. But there's been a similar change in the rural areas. And frankly, in the suburbs, there's sort of a counter trend. A lot of suburban voters who historically would have it, at least leaned Republican, if not been solidly Republican, are um, uh, you, you know up for grabs. Um, we didn't see as much of that in this state, but we saw it in neighboring states, in Pennsylvania, in Michigan, in Wisconsin. Um, so the um, so, so I'm not sure. So the state's still very, very competitive, but but it's probably drifting into a redder shade of purple uh, than it, than it used to used to have. I don't know if that's correct, but you you, you get you get what I mean. Um, it's funny. There's uh, uh, there was. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk in this election about whether we're going to have a big blue wave, and some people thought we were going to have a red counter wave. And, but um, Glenn Reynolds, who's writing in U.S. Today, said that he thought what we ended up with was a purple puddle. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Ohio or nationwide? Nationwide. <laughs> I do want to point, there are some positive things I thought about Ohio. One, we've elected our first African-American uh, statewide official in uh, Judge Stewart which was the first time that's ever happened mm -hmm. in Ohio history, Democratic, African-American, uh, and two seats on the Supreme Court uh, that's no longer 7-0, but will now be 5-2. You know, so that's a positive. There were four pickup of uh, House Democratic seats in the House side. It's still a supermajority, but four is better than zero. Um, and there was an increase in turnout of voters on both sides. I mean, there was an increase across the state. There was a wave, but there was, like you said, there were two waves. And that's what happens when you have two waves. You just don't know how it's going to end. Um, but we didn't have the problems that we're, I wish we had the problems that Florida and Georgia had with provisional ballots uh, being able to be the deciding factor, but that wasn't the case this go round. But again, um, if you ask me, I think we're closer to being a red, we're closer to being Indiana than we are Michigan. And that's my concern is that the, uh, you know, the people in Washington make big decisions about where to put investments. And if they believe that Ohio was another Indiana, that will slow down a lot of the dollars that comes into the state for voter mobilization, for ballot measures, for support for these kind of things. And so uh, I think we have one more bite at the apple. But um, as long as Donald Trump's approval ratings in the high 40s and low 50s, it's going to be very hard for um, at least Democrats to invest the type of dollars in the state that they put in here in 2012 and 2008, 12, and 16. Does this mean that we could actually watch television during a presidential election year and <laughs> not hear the voice of doom coming on at every commercial? <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, that's the one advantage. A lot of the uh, television stations won't make as much money. How about that? <laughs> I think that you you see it in um, southeast Ohio, uh, Strickland. That was always kind of a yeah. swing area um, uh, in terms of dis dissatisfaction with the economy or whatever. 
And that, that's really trended lately solidly Republican, except for Athens County. Yeah, that's uh, right. and, We're and, still working down there to get it right. <laughs> and, I, and I also, I think that one of the discouraging things, at least from my point of view, is, is, uh, is this happened in the Trump era, meaning what would the vote have been if Trump wasn't president, if you know, someone like Jeb Bush or somebody less offensive, less disliked, you know, less motivating, meaning people came, Democrats came out to vote because uh, of their dislike of, for the president. Uh, if he's not on the ballot, if he's not there, what, what would the, would Mike DeWine have had 54% of the vote? Um, well, those suburban people surrounding Columbus who came out to vote for Danny O'Connor, would they, would they, you know, would they have been as motivated? Um, so that that's something Democrats need to need to ponder, ponder as well. And, and it's still true that no Republican president has ever become president without winning Ohio. So they still have to win Ohio. So the burden's going to be on they being the Republicans still have to win Ohio in order for you know, to make that threshold. So, uh, but Democrats may not mm -hmm. have to win Ohio because they now have Georgia and they have Arizona and they have <laughs> other states that are probably a better bet for investments than Ohio. Uh, so that's the danger of, of losing these things. You are, you're competing with about eight other states that want to be the next Ohio. And right now that could easily be Georgia uh, or Arizona. And I, I, I this is a little bit of a, I don't know what, but I'll make the point anyway. Um, the Supreme Court races are, are a real puzzle. I mean, they're always entertaining because we don't know what the heck's going to happen. And, um, and this was another example. Um, Melody Stewart is a great candidate, and um, she won 52% of the vote. Yeah. Uh, but Michael Donnelly... He won 61% of the vote. A Democrat won 61% of the vote. And we have to ask ourselves, how did that happen? Uh, was that just Donnelly's a good name? Are we back to that? Donnelly replacing O'Donnell? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I hate to suggest that <laughs> yeah. names play a role, but. Well, it was Stewart versus De Janeiro. I mean, I, 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 I it's just, but anyway, for those Democrats who are feeling sad, you, Michael Donnelly won 61% of the vote. It is it's, worth yeah. noting, though, that yeah. D's and R's do not yes. appear on the yeah. ballot yeah. in the general election. Yes. Um, so yes. name recognition may be all folks had to go by. And that's how we're choosing the top flight of our judges, but our justices. <laughs> Any other thoughts on that? Yeah. And I have one other statistic, I, which is that um, this was a surprising statistic who, um, when it comes to first-time voters, um, they were 12% of the electorate were first-time voters. 52% of those first-time voters voted for Mike DeWine. Yeah. 52%. 52% voted for Mike DeWine. To me, that was, that was a surprising number. Yeah. I, I, I think so. Yeah. 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 And at a polling place where I was approaching voters, a young woman who she turned out she's 25 years old, walking out of the polls, agreed to talk to me about her vote. My brain said this is a young suburban woman who is, you know, absolutely in the D column. And she said, no, I'm a lifelong Republican. I vote a straight Republican. So what you think, you know, you often find out you don't. Um, this is a question about the process and concern about the process. Um, given that the incoming Secretary of State has selected Ken Blackwell to head up his transition, and that Ken Blackwell, a former Ohio Secretary of State, has been uh, doing the pundit circuit in challenging the legality and legitimacy of the Florida recount, what should we be concerned about with voter access in Ohio under Frank LaRose? <laughs> <laughs> well, we should be very concerned. Ken Blackwell was uh, a member of the uh, now de uh, uh, discredited uh, Voter uh, Integrity Commission that the president set up 
It was disbanded because it lacked credibility, because there was no basis for the charge that there were millions of, of uh, illegal votes. Uh, even Republican members of that commission um, uh, discredited it because it, it gave the impression that they were a commission looking for a problem that didn't exist and trying to fulfill uh, one of the president's uh, many, many uh, disturbing statements about how he was elected and why. Um, so uh, Ken Blackwell was an apologist for the president on that. Ken Blackwell uh, gave us holy hell when he was secretary of state. Um, anybody who was around in 2004 remember what we went through with the size of the ballot or the weight of the paper on, the, on all the people standing in lines uh, in the rain because of uh, policies of Ken Blackwell to restrict the number of polling precincts and number of people who stood in line for two hours and then uh, we're told you're in the wrong line. Start back from the beginning. That's one of Ken Blackwell's famous uh, uh, um, acts. So those things make me very nervous. I didn't know he was actually in charge of the transition. I just thought he was hanging he's, around. He's actually, he's <laughs> he, actually in charge. There are of? actually two, and he's been. Okay, well, that makes me nervous. And he just comes off as such a partisan player, and I would hope that uh, Frank LaRose, who I know, and I've met him a few times, and he seems like a reasonable person. Uh, I personally, I like Kathleen Clyde a lot better because she had worked with us and helped us defeat 194. Um, but he had spoke to me a lot about civility, and he even came down to OU with the, did a program with us about the need for civility back in 2000, um, uh, 2000, what was it, 11, I guess, no, 2016. So let's see what happens. But I just don't think that that's a good signal to send to people who went through that with Ken Blackwell. Michael and John, I mean, this is Frank LaRose's home territory. Can you explain why he made that appointment? No, I mean, um, that's why we, I was baffled by it. Um, I, it's, you know, Frank deserves uh, praise for working across the aisle. He worked hard on redistricting reform. Uh, he was one of the few voices uh, you know, when there weren't a lot of voices. I mean, Houston was another one, believe it or not. And yeah, he was. He yep. was. In all fairness, he was. And, um, uh, and Frank ha does has talked about civility, and um, he is a, you know, a decent and obviously s he's a smart person. Um, this is just in a campaign in which he tarred his opponent for being too partisan. I mean, those are the first words of criticism for Kathleen Clyde out of the LaRose campaign. She's too partisan. I'm not. I'm the guy who can work across the aisle. Mm -hmm. To then select Ken Blackwell is just um, just a bad, bad choice. And and I don't know what it says about his, his judgment. I, I don't. I. I I've heard the, the idea that he wanted to protect himself on the right, and he had picked Joanne Davidson. And, but given what, what uh, Ken Blackwell was even tweeting Saturday morning, the day after, about how Florida was manufacturing voters, yeah. um, that kind of that's stuff. just not the, uh, when there's you know, absolutely no evidence for that, and you know how partisan that statement is. Um, they're just, it's just uh, very disappointing to see Frank do that. Dr. Green, anything to add on that? Well, you know, lots of strange things happen in politics. No. And, uh, and, and some of the best laid cleverest plans, like I'm going to cover my right flank or left flank, um, fail, right? And, and, I, and I think there, this is a place where it may actually turn out to be whatever the initial motivations were. And I, I, know, I know Frank quite well and, and admire him, but you know, sometimes people make mistakes. Okay. Um, in the category of should we be afraid, very afraid, um, do you think that when the new district lines are drawn, looking ahead to that, well, first let's talk about the census and then looking ahead to the actual lawns, law, lines being drawn. Can we expect fairness or obstructionism and dirty tricks? Let's start with the census. The census is where they come up with the numbers that determine how many districts we'll have. What should we be watching with the census? Go ahead. I think we should be concerned that there are steps at the federal government to 
uh, reduce funding for the U.S. Census, uh, the procedures that we used in past years to try and have door-to-door -door campaigns and surveys uh, for the undercount are being decimated. Those programs are not going to be renewed. Uh, there's new definitions. Maybe you can speak more about the definitions that are being proposed on citizenship uh, for a question that might change the very foundation of how the census and why the census was put together. Uh, that may even um, give people some doubt that they may not need to fill it out if they're not a citizen. We count every human body, not every human citizen. Um, and that's, that's what censuses are for. Uh, and so, but if you change the designation, that's what my concern is. Uh, I, I can talk about redistricting, but I'll just come back let's, around. Yeah, yeah, let's go through census first and then. I, I, I just think the question is uh, on the question about citizenship, I think is a crucial, uh, but that's what I would keep my, keep my eye on. I mean, I think that you listen to the experts even within the Census Bureau and this is a question that uh, shouldn't be asked. It's asked on the, uh, the community survey, but this is the census. And, uh, um, and uh, it's, it's, it's just, uh, as, as was said, I mean, we, we may not get an accurate count and so much is based on that. What, one of the most uh, disturbing trends to me in, in politics is how um, many, um, well-respected government agencies are being politicized. And, you know, I, I wouldn't uh, absolve one party over the other, but we just see an example of that. Um, historically, the Census Bureau has been one of the most trusted government agencies, and they have kept confidentiality um, and, and done it really, really quite well. Um, and, you know, the, uh, as Michael mentioned, a lot of the experts in the Census Bureau, who are demographers and yeah. really know about this, are, are quite disturbed about putting these types of questions that could not only undermine participation, but it could have other kinds of, of effects. One might want to say unintended effects, but, you know, when when agencies become politicized, then the effects are intended, right? That's, that's why you do these sorts of things. So it's something really to worry about, I think. Um, the census is not just about uh, representation. It's about a whole lot of other things. And, you know, we have to be very cautious about having that messed with. And there has been over the, you know, Tom Sawyer actually was very heavily involved in the whole effort to make the census better and to, to make it more reflective of, of, of uh, you know, people of color and that kind of thing, and the multiplicity of the, of the society. And uh, to see this take place is, is distressing, and it takes place in a context. If this were the only issue, that would be one thing. But there are so many, it, well, it wouldn't be one thing. It, it would be bad anyway, but it gets worse <laughs> uh, when you consider the context in which it is taking place, the, the very driving of a, a anti-immigration message. And, um, uh, and, 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 I, and I just have to share this one th last thing, but um, in, in 2016, 13% said that immigration was the top issue. So that was the third issue. In 2018, and Trump won that group by 31 points uh, in Ohio. In 2018, 25% said immigration was the top issue, and that was second, only second to health care. Mike DeWine won that group of people by 67 percentage points, 83 to 16. Now that may be your proof that the caravan <laughs> was working. Uh, it was driving, driving the thinking of, 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 of many voters. Though and Ohio the, has one of the least, the, the yeah, lowest percentages yeah. of immigrants, of foreign-born right. residents exactly. of any right. state. Exactly. And that's the context in which, you know, we now have the Commerce Secretary trying to f jam this question into the census. Well, Whatever the census comes up with, however it does, many people are projecting that Ohio, having lower growth in population, will lose at least one seat. So census comes in, we have the new rules in place, what can we expect to see? All fair and everybody behaving themselves, or? 
be afraid? Well, it'll be interesting to see how they behave because there are strong incentives built into our new redistricting rules. Um, so w one party will be in charge of the process. Uh, maybe the Democrats, maybe the Republicans. But uh, if they want to draw a map that lasts for 10 years, they need votes from the minority party. Now, um, if you're looking, if you're ambitious and you think that you really want to help your party, then it might make sense to compromise with some people on the other side so you can have a map that lasts for 10 years. If you can't get that kind of support, if it's a really a, a partisan gerrymander, which is what we have typically had, then you only get your seat for four years, you only get your map for four years. And, and what happens during those four years? There's a gubernatorial election. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how, you know, real life politicians uh, calculate the difference between a short term, highly partisan map versus a long term, much more balanced map. Um, it, I think they'll go for the more balanced long-term map. That's my sense because uh, I think ambition will lead people to make um, what are decisions more in the public interest. Uh, but you know, I've been wrong before. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I'm hopeful that they're going to take um, a shot at it. You know, we all negotiated that and again Vernon Sykes was the leader of this thing for a long time and I have to give him credit for hanging in there all those years but you know this uh, proposal that was submitted and passed by the voters gives them two shots at the apple as was said and the um, some of these guys I believe are trying to set themselves up for future office and maybe they won't care maybe they'll 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 try to do the short-term thing and get out and start running for higher office like governor and senator and things like that. But uh, I think we really need to keep the pressure on the league and all those people who sign petitions. Don't let those people forget that the voters wanted independent commissions. They compromised and gave you this chance to do it right yourself on a bipartisan basis without an independent commission taking you out of it completely. So I don't believe that that fervor is gone in this state. And I think we should keep reminding them that if you can't get it right for 10 years on this go round, then we can always go back to the independent commission. And you guys will be sitting outside watching it on television. <laughs> uh, and so I think that's, that's going to take some work. But if we stay with it and they know that we just didn't abandon ship because the election changed, I'm sorry the way things turned out. Uh, in certain respects, because the, the key pl players, the governor, the sector of state, I'll be surprised, and if the wine wants to make it fair, I'll be happy. But it's a new uh, year. we got to do something on a bipartisan basis. That's already set up for them, so let's hope for it to happen. But if I could just say something about reapportionment um, and the way we undercount the census. I mean, we don't want to lose money coming into Ohio because of pol making it partisan. Well, if you politicize the census, you politicize redistricting, you politicize the money coming into the state for health care and, and child care, then you're just playing a political game and you're putting the issues, you're putting the needs of your state second. And I think we need to just remind them that they need to put the needs of the voters first. Just a reminder that Ohio politicians don't live in a bubble. There were four redistricting issues on the ballot around the country, all four passed yes. in this past election. So um, here's somebody who's just there a need to expand and increase the membership, the size of the House of Representatives? Oh, Lord. Let's go crazy. Let's. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. Um, the. I believe they're talking about the U.S. House. US. The U.S. House. Um, uh, the ah, or the Senate. Okay, we'll go increase yeah. the size well, of Congress. Well, I mean, we might 
think about increasing the size of the Senate. I mean, the but but the size of the House, 435 members, is it, it, it's. If it got any bigger than that, it, it really would not function well. Of course, not functioning very well right now, but if we had uh, even more, I, I, I don't think that would, um, would, would help things very much. The Senate's a different idea. I mean, if you, you know, the, all states are represented equally in the Senate. Um, and, you know, two senators is kind of arbitrary. I mean, you know, if, if, if 435 still works, I don't know, what if we had three senators for each state? Um, you know, then, uh, so that maybe that would work. I don't know. What do you think? I, well, I think that you should increase the size of the House of Representatives, uh, but I would start with the U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, Guam, American Samoa, and the District of Columbia. Those are five people who now have uh, seats in Congress. They have... 22 staff people in Washington, they get the same budget as everybody else who's a member of Congress, but they just can't vote on the floor. And so if that's only five seats, let's go with those five first. Uh, I also think we should probably consider term limits for the Supreme Court if we're going to have this situation the way it's going. And that could be something that it may take a Constitution amendment more than likely. Yeah. So it won't be an easy thing, but I'm so afraid that if we end up with a 6-3 situation, that's the only thing I could think of on the short term that would give us a shot. It's the total unraveling of the voting rights, civil rights, and women's rights, and workers' rights of this country in the next five to 10 years. So, I mean, that sounds like a radical idea, but I'd rather do that uh, than to try to expand the House of Representatives. Well, well, you know, there's another radical idea which has been proposed from both the left and the right, which is that maybe we should have a second constitutional convention. Well, that's, a, well, that, that's <laughs> something I wouldn't support because, and I think you know why. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you, you'd probably know why, too. It's just, we could have a whole meeting on just that. Yeah, right? Right. But I think it would be a, 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 a very frightening situation to open our constitution after 200 and some odd years mm -hmm. to that type of gathering, which would be a spectacle. And uh, I don't know who would control it. We, but, uh, yeah, it'd be a terrible, well, scary thing. I mean, when you think about it, each representative is about 600,000 people. In England, it's 100, roughly, 100,000 per member of parliament. They have a 650, or roughly. Um, in, in Germany, it's about 116,000 per member. Um, the founders. Did, you know, Madison did have a plan, you know, he was going to, you know, increase it depending on the size. We're at 435 because um, in the, you know, in the progressive era, we decided, whoa, it's getting large because it grew from about to mid, middle of the 18th, 19th century to the early 20th century. It grew from about 250 roughly yeah, to yeah. 435. Uh, so, there is an argument for making it larger. Maybe not, you know, uh, if it were 100,000, we'd have a, we would, we would be unruly. <laughs> but, to, but to think about the benefits of, of members of the House representing fewer people so that it would cost less maybe to campaign, uh, you, you, they'd be more acquainted with their constituents, it would become less of a uh, kind of machine in that, in that in, you know, kind of... I, I, I just think it, it's never going to happen because we couldn't possibly have that conversation. We can't pass a budget. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but right. but it, it, the theory is, 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 worth, is worth thinking about, and it's good to see people kind of beginning to talk about it a little bit. Okay, um, just uh, we're we're nearly out of time, and I want to get to a couple questions that are talking about the influence of money in politics and the tone of campaigns. Um, to listen to political commercials, all politicians are corrupt, and is there any way that that can be turned so the candidates are talking more directly about themselves and what they have to offer? And just is there any way to reduce the level of money, the influence of money in politics? I think the repeal of Citizens United is the way we have to start. 
and the McClutchin decision where we basically took the caps off of all the amounts of money that people can give to campaigns. I mean, once that money flooded into um, these parties and to these campaigns, it just sort of took the decision making in many parts away from community groups like the NACP and the League of Women Voters and community based organizations and put it in the hands of super PACs who now drive dollars in and out of our communities to influence our elections. Um, it's great if you have a super PAC, if you don't have one, it's a lot harder to influence your community. So uh, we've seen the results of that now. If you get rid of Citizens United, you may have a better shot of doing it. And there are some states that are doing that, even at the county level, allowing for a public financing uh, uh, possibility. And I know the League and Common Cause and others have been pushing that idea. Um, but yeah, until you change the money formula, we're going to still be in the same situation of having these elections controlled by uh, uh, really big dollar uh, uh, players who have their own interests at, at heart. Any other thoughts? Can we reduce the influence of money in politics? Should we? Well, we could enlarge the House of Representatives. Um, <laughs> uh, Here we go. We have to go with that. Uh, I, I, this is a little bit like redistricting reform, only more difficult. Um, meaning, I think maybe we've created something a lot better on redistricting reform. We'll have to see how it actually works. Uh, uh, whether the worst instincts or better instincts prevail. Um, that's going to be very, very hard with money. I mean, it's, 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 I, I, I you know, I, I, I don't have an answer for this. I mean, I just don't. Dr. Green? Well, you know, part of the, the role of money in politics and the lack of civility are closely related because one of the mechanisms by which we have the kind of spending we're talking about is the idea of an independent expenditure. So one way that someone with their super PAC can uh, demonstrate independence is to not be for a candidate, but to be against a candidate. Um, and, you know, the, we, I hate to see that, but the reason they do that is because, you know, it works. Um, and so maybe ultimately it's it's the voters that have to, you know, change their mind. Um, I don't know if that would restrict money, but it would certainly money would be used differently if, if you know a flight of negative ads were run here in Ohio and immediately, you know, a large percentage of the voters said I'm not going to I'm not going to react to that. Um, I'm not going to do what they want me to do. I'm going to do something different. Um, but we we are in a place in our society where. Um, and, I, and I hate to say this, but negativity is, is very, very powerful uh, when it comes to mobilizing voters. Okay. Um, the last question I've got kind of takes us back to the beginning. Should Sherrod Brown be running for president in 2020, and what are his chances? Dr. Green? Well, um, I would strongly support Sherrod Brown if he wanted to run for the uh, Democratic nomination. I've known him for years and years, and that's not really a partisan statement. I just think he's the kind of high-quality public servant that would, would probably do a very good job in, in the White House. Um, I suspect that he will have lots of competitors, um, and, and what would give Senator Brown uh, some uh, uh, make a good case for his candidacy are things that might not appeal to other parts of the country. Um, and, and so, um, but he's got that dog. He does. He does. And you know, I must say, I was really amazed at his uh, commercials, where the real Sherrod showed up in his jeans and his hair wasn't combed. And I thought, wow. Uh, but then a reporter called me from the New York Times and said, "Are all of you like that in Ohio?" <laughs> and you said, "Yes." <laughs> but anyway, that's my view. I, well, I, I like Sheriff Brown, too. I've known him for about 30 years. He's been a good friend. He'd be a great candidate for president. Um, the one thing he might create is two candidates for president from Ohio running at the same time. So that would create, uh, now you can get back on the map by being uh, the battleground of which person from Ohio should be president, if you can get <laughs> the front runner status. And then the May primary in 2020 could really be something. So uh, maybe those other guys will stay out, but the thing is coming in number two would be important. But if he, I don't know if he's going to do it, but if he does do it, I think all those values that I know I care about 
many of you care about could really be on display. And he has a nature about him that, you know, he doesn't mind, you know, being working with both sides. So uh, he's civil. He doesn't throw a lot of bombs if he doesn't have to. And and uh, I just think he'd be a great person. And um, I hope he considers it. I'll be glad to help him any way I can. Michael? Well, he's, he's kind of got a little bit of Howard Metzenbaum's yeah. profile now. I mean, he's, he's liberal, but there are people who vote for him because they mm -hmm. think he's on their side, and, uh, and he is in many ways. Um, it, we run the risk of overstating maybe his victory, not that it wasn't you know, significant and good that he held the seat, but he outspent um, Renacy on TV, 14 million to 1 million. Um, he didn't face the third party or the independent expenditures hammering away on him that he did uh, six years ago. Uh, Renacy was never really quite got his footing. Uh, um, and, and so um, it was a, it was a, you know, it wasn't, it was a, it was a good test obviously, but uh, Sherrod was, um, uh, is going to have a hard job running running for the Democratic nomination and running, but I uh, and winning. But I think that uh, the unfortunate thing at the moment is that there are <laughs> many people are in the same situation he is, and it's hard to see your way through the crowd that's going to be running eventually. I mean, if you talk to people in California, they don't like they they say critical things of Harris, you know, uh, if you knew her, you'd, uh, and, and if you talk to people, uh, others who are, whose names are, are raised as well. So uh, I, I, it's a vetting process and we'll, we'll see how he, how he, how he emerges. And he may not get past Christmas. He may just decide not to do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was, can I just say there was some statistics that Brown won, uh, I guess Cordray won 53% of the labor vote where Sherrod won 62% of the labor vote. Uh, uh, Cordray won 63% of the urban vote. Brown won 70% of the urban vote. Of the suburban vote, Cordray won 43%. Brown, 47%. And of the rural vote, Cordray won 33%. And Sherrod Brown won 43%. So that suggests that he does have something else uh, going. I wish they had run together in every event he went to. I wish they would just run in as running mates, but that didn't happen. But it does show that he has appeal, crossover appeal among uh, DeWine voters and Trump voters. And so that's something that's kind of unique among uh, Democrat, the, the lineup of Democrats. Not many people can probably say that who might be running in that big crowd and field of 20 plus candidates. And after all that, so two years from now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <Next> <laughs> all week. right. Well, thank you, gentlemen, very much for your input. And thanks to all of you. Thanks for having me. Give yourselves a hand. Um, you are all still interested in politics, even after this exhausting season. And I think that says something for all of us. So thank you again. Well, before you get up, um, I just would again like to thank our audience for the wonderful questions that you asked and really I think it was a robust uh, conversation that we had so on behalf of the leagues of women voters of the Akron area and greater Cleveland thank you so much and we really look forward to um, too, by the way. She yes we questions. had a great moderator we had an excellent <laughs> panel um, it, it really it doesn't get much better than this so thank you all and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Thank you.